Now, most people, when they think about vital signs, they think about three things, blood pressure, respiratory rate, and pulse. But there's a lot more to vital signs. I wanna give you an extended review of vital signs. This is what we need to be looking at. It's not just those three, it's a lot more. First is responsiveness. So we check that by getting our AFPU scale, talk about that, and GCS, getting a score. We're gonna talk about that. Now on the respiratory side, yes, we look at respiratory rates, but what is the quality of the respirations? How deep are those respirations? Are they adequate? What about pulse oximetry and end tidal CO2? We're gonna talk about that. On the cardiovascular side, yes, we got our blood pressure and our pulse. We're gonna talk about that. And the others, the accessory things we look for. What about getting a blood glucose level? What's normal on that? What about pupils? How do we do that? And then neurogenic functions. You may have heard about getting a pulse motor sensory function. This right here, I call it my extended review of vital signs. Here we go. Now the mnemonic you're gonna hear about is AVPU. That mnemonic, A-V-P-U, is gonna help us determine how responsive the patient is. You know, we can have a patient who's like me right now, I'm alert, I'm talking. That would be alert and talking, like alert and oriented, right? Right. But on the other side of this, what if you approached me and I didn't respond to you initially? But then when you said my name, oh, I opened my eyes. That's a verbal stimulus. What if you called my name out and I still don't respond? Let's say you did a sternal rub and then I was able to respond. You saw my eyes open up. That's responding to a painful stimuli. Now let's say you approach the patient, call their name out, nothing, painful stimulus, nothing, and they're still unresponsive. Well, that's a patient who is unresponsive, right? So this is the first of a vital signs, check responsiveness. GCS, the Glasgow Coma Scale, some call it Glasgow Coma Score, it's called GCS. Let's go over that now. And what that is, is a little more in detail of your mental status. Now with the Glasgow Coma Scale, this scale is based upon 15 points being the best score we can get and three points being the worst. The mnemonic I wanna give you is EVM456. The EVM is the three categories. Eye opening, V, verbal, M, motor. So EVM, and then what is the best number in each category? A four, a five, and a six. So GCS, EVM, four, five, six, and then think one, one, one. Four, five, six is 15. One, one, one is three. So remember the 15 to three scale. Now all we gotta do is know what's in the middle. Here it is. So here we have what the eye opening, spontaneous eye opening is four. If we just get a verbal response, it's three. Painful stimulus response is two with eye opening. Unresponsive, one. Verbal, alert and oriented, five points. Confusion, four points. Now at three points for verbal is inappropriate words. Just sounds, not words, that's two points. One point in verbal for an unresponsive patient. Now over here with motor, obeying commands, six points. Localizes to pain, five points. Withdraws from pain, that's four points. Now the final two here. We know one's unresponsive, about three and two. So an abnormal flexion. So remember, flexion comes in towards the core, okay? That's the corticate posturing. Okay, the cerebrate posturing, we're gonna move out like this, and this is gonna be a abnormal extension. So towards the core is would be first, and then later on would be an abnormal extension, okay? Number two, that's a way to remember it, okay? And then one is unresponsive. So that's your GCS, let's move on. Now on respiratory, yes, we're gonna look at the rate, the rhythm, the quality, the sounds, how deep they're breathing. This all gives a picture of the patient. When it comes to the vital sign though, the number, 
That's their respiratory rate. And that's what we have here. So this is the range a key can use in your practice. These are normal respiratory rates per age group. So adults around 12 to 20, 13 to 18, around 12 to 16, eight year olds to 12 year olds, 18 to 30, four to five years old, about 22 to 34, one to three, 24 to 40, infants 30 to 60, right? Obviously a newborn, a newborn child is gonna be, it could be a little more than this, but around the same as an infant. So that's what we're gonna look at as far as respiratory rates. What we're looking for is a number. Pulse oximetry, also known as SpO2. Our normal range is 94% to 99%. It's a probe, we're gonna place it on the patient's finger. Now what's gonna happen is this probe is gonna measure how well oxygen is binding to the red blood cell, the hemoglobin. How well are we oxygenating our red blood cells? Basically, how well are we oxygenating our tissues thus, right? So, what this means. Normal level is 94, 99. But here's the thing to remember. If we have a patient that has carbon monoxide, CO, poisoning, CO has a greater affinity than oxygen to our red blood cell hemoglobin, which what happens in CO poisoning is we can have a full saturation of our hemoglobin, but not by oxygen, by carbon monoxide CO. So we get a pulse oximetry and it shows 99, 100%, but it's CO, it's binded to CO, not oxygen. So please caution that. Remember the greater affinity. Now, when do we give oxygen? We give oxygen to our patient when they have a low SpO2, a low level. Some patients will have a lower SpO2 at baseline, like COPD patients and smokers. You may have heard about end tidal CO2, also known as capnography. The reason we have this is for a lot of reasons. The first thing that comes to mind is confirmation of you placing a breathing tube in your patient. That's the first thing that comes to mind. But as an assessment tool for other patients, if we have a sedated patient, if we have an unresponsive patient, if we have a cardiac or respiratory patient, end tidal CO2 is a great tool. What it does, it measures the exhaled carbon dioxide from your patient. And we get a number back on that. A normal number of end tidal CO2 is 35 to 45. You gotta know that. Now, the number is too low or too high at the paramedic level, we're gonna to wanna to take action on that number that we get to get the patient back to a normal level. Another place that I didn't mention yet would be cardiac arrest. You can use Intel CO2 to see how well you are running your cardiac arrest, how well your compressions and ventilations are doing, right? So this is why we use Intel CO2. Will not be used on every patient, but in these certain situations, it is the best tool we have. Now here's blood pressure. With blood pressure, we get a number back based upon the amount of pressure that's enacted on the walls of our arteries. Now, we have a systolic and a diastolic number. Systolic is our top number. Diastolic is our bottom number, right? Now, remember, I'm thinking about systolic, Think action, that's the action number. Diastolic, think rest phase, that's the bottom number. So adults, 120 over 80, that's pretty normal, okay? A neonate, completely different. 80 or 40 would be a fine blood pressure in a neonate. And anywhere in between here, you can see between 120, 80, 80, 40, as we get closer up to the adult age, the blood pressure will get closer to here, the closer we are to a neonate, 80-40, would be closer to there. That's your range for your blood pressure. Now you may have heard about pulse and heart rate. There's a difference you need to know about. Pulse is what you feel. Heart rate is what the monitor tells you, or what the monitor, like a pulse ox, would tell you. So heart rate is what you see, pulse is what you feel. So that's a big difference. So if you hear that, you gotta know that. 
right? Now, in an adult patient, 60 to 100 would be your normal heart rate, your normal pulse. But you gotta know that if a patient has a very efficient cardiovascular system and heart, like an athlete or a runner, for example, your heart rate could be lower at baseline, like 40s, 50s, and I've even heard of some people in the high 30s. It's possible. Now, here are some ages to look out for your normal, your normal rates. Two to 10 years, 60 to 140. Three months to two years, 100 to 190. One to three months, about 85 to 205. There it is. And now we're on to our pupil exam. So at pupils, we got three main pathways. Normal, I have a mnemonic for you. Constricted, and then dilated pupils. So normal, you may have heard about the pupil to pearl. Here's a mnemonic. P, pupils. E, we have equal pupils, so equal. And they're round, they're regular size, and reaction to light. Which reminds us, this pearl reminds us what we're looking for. Reminds us we're looking for reactivity, we're looking for the appropriate size. We're looking for them to be equal on both sides and the same. That's what reminds what normal is. Now abnormal would be constricted. An example of that would be like pinpoint pupils, extremely constricted small pupils, and then dilated pupils, which would be a large pupil. Just right off the bat, some, some situations where we could have constricted pupils on both sides, opiate overdose, and there could also be trauma as well that could cause that. Now, the most common finding is something called pinpoint pupils. That happens in opiate overdose. So an overdose is on, let's say, heroin or oxycodone, oxycontin, for example, right? Now, what else? If we have a dilated pupil, that could be cocaine, for example, right? So remember, the big thing is drugs and alcohol, trauma, and I want to give you another one to remember, neurologic conditions like stroke can change your pupils. If we have, for example, an injury to our brain, we can have unequal pupils or unreactive to light pupils. So that's something we want to look at as well. Now, a blood glucose level, we want to check that in any patient that has altered mental status. So if their GCS is off, if their AFPU is off, get a blood glucose level. If they're a diabetic patient, get a blood glucose level. If your patient, somebody doesn't feel right in your gut, get a blood glucose level. It's one of our extended vital signs. So never be scared to get a blood glucose. It's always to give you some information. Now, here's the thing. A normal blood glucose over every patient, anywhere from 80 to 120, that's our normal. For example, when we have a glucometer, you may See, the glucometer say LO, which is low, or HI, which is high. Now, every glucometer is different, but 80 to 120 is a normal range. But we can have, you know, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, or more. Depending on the glucometer, it will hit a point where it stops with a number and gives you HI, high. Now, same with low, there will be a number on the glucometer, all the way down to zero, of course where at some point it will hit, depending on the device, where it will give you LO low. It's as high as we can go, as low as we can go. So that's obviously really bad, right? Now, when do we start seeing symptoms? When does this become really bad hypoglycemia, not enough blood glucose in the body? Typically, we see symptoms under 60, 60 to 70 being that gray area, but really, typically, it's below 60. But here's the thing. Please hear me on this. Every diabetic is different. You can have a diabetic and their blood glucose is 60 and they're unresponsive on the floor. Where you have another diabetic and they're at 60 and they're awake talking to you and they're fine. So every diabetic is different, but use this numbers to kind of gauge where you're at. And always remember that usually this is spot on, but it can be different. Every diabetic is different. A quick neuro exam, I like to call one of our extended vital signs, 
because it's so important when we're doing a focus assessment. Now, pulse motor sensory function. You may have heard about this with a trauma assessment. We want to check for a pulse in all four extremities. So we can do this. We have two arms and two legs, so get a pulse. Make sure you can feel a pulse in each extremity. The motor, can the patient, do we have equal grips? Can they squeeze your hand, right? Can they move their feet? And then sensory, so if you obviously go in, let's say you're doing equal grips and you need to squeeze your hand. Can you feel me touching here? Feel me here. Same with the foot. Feel me here. Feel me here. That sensory function. So if they have a pulse, their motor and sensory in all four extremities, that is called pulse motor sensory times four. You're going to hear about that in class. Now, a lot of you asked in the comments about how to prepare for school, how to get through school, and how to pass NREMT. The first link in the description is a study tool that I give to all my students to accomplish all of that. It's called the Video Vault. Inside the Video Vault is over 480 videos of content, audio files, worksheets, practice quizzes, our community group. What I do in the Video Vault is take all the concepts you need to know to pass school at NREMT and I break them down simply for you. So that way you just follow along with the videos, you follow the study plan, and you pass. I give my students lifetime access in the first link in the description, and I'll see you on the inside.